أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم One of the realizations that the Quran presents to us is the uh, degree and the status of our holy beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam who occupies a position like no other within the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one of the verses that uh, demonstrates his superiority and his excellence is verse number 56 of chapter 33, Surah Al-Ahzab, which we touched upon last week, highlighting some of the jurisprudential as well as spiritual elements associated with it. Now, of course, when we come to this verse, the realization emerges that the salawat upon the Prophet and his progeny, of course, is something that Muslims perform on a regular basis and at the same time in their prayers too. So if we were to calculate uh, and approximate that over a billion human beings would perform prayers on a daily basis, this would bring uh, the number of the times that the name of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, is mentioned to uh, over 18 uh, billion times on a daily basis around the world of course and this has been the case for 1400 years and of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that for the Holy Prophet when he said that your mentioning and your name will be continuously exalted um, the notion that we have presented as well is the idea that with the salawat the dua is accepted so it's highly recommended to start the dua and to end the dua as well with the salawat and interestingly we have a, a, a narration in the book Tawheed uh, by Sheikh al-Saduq from the Holy Prophet peace and blessings be upon him and the Holy Progeny which says لا تضربوا أطفالكم على بكائهم do not strike your children when they cry um, and the reason is he says according to the narration the first four months when they are crying the first four months of their lives when they are crying they're actually testifying to the oneness of Allah they're saying Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah and the next four months they are reciting the salawat upon the prophet and his progeny and the next four months so within the year the last uh, four months of the year uh, they are performing dua for their parents. That is uh, a beautiful way that the Prophet of Islam uh, is presenting this notion about the uh, weeping and the uh, crying of the uh, children uh, as well. Uh, no doubt much can be mentioned with regards to the uh, significance of the salawat upon the Holy Prophet and as well as uh, his uh, family. One thing we do say though that the uh, salawat is uh, not an act that the human being themselves are sending their own grace towards God. They're actually asking for God's grace and mercy to fall on the, upon the Holy Prophet. Does he need it and does the Ahl Bayt need it? Well, it is always uh, the case with regards to raising the status and, uh, you know, uh, in, making the position higher and higher and that that is infinite in the eyes of God of course these particular uh, statuses so to speak or stations that people and human beings can actually uh, attain and that's why in, uh, in Al-Kafi we have a narration from uh, the sixth holy imam from the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and his Holy Prophet, which says, "Man salla alayya salatan wahida, sallallahu alayhi alf salatin fi alf saffin min al malaika." That whomsoever does recites one salawat upon the Prophet and his family, Allah responds back by performing salawat uh, upon this individual collectively with a thousand rows of angels. So it is a gift that the human beings have been presented by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they partake in this wonderful dhikr. And uh, one of the 
uh, narrations tells us that the um, Imam Ali Salam Amir Mu'minin was once confronted by an individual who is non-Muslim and said to him, you know, we believe that Abraham has a higher status of all the prophets because God chose him to be the father of the prophets. All the prophets are from his line. And of course, uh, the response of the Imam Ali Salam was that the status of the Prophet of Islam is higher. And look at his remembrance, that uh, the Salawat establishes this notion, this idea. Until the Day of Judgment, no one is remembered as much as the Messenger of Allah. Peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. And if you see someone reciting Salawat often, we are told that they are blessed. We are told this is a special blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them once they are accustomed and more into the salawat uh, that will certainly help them in this world, but of course uh, more so in akhirah. Verse number 57 uh, goes on to discuss something which is totally the opposite. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ those who injure or hurt or torment Allah and His Messenger are the subjects of the la'an of Allah in this world as well as the hereafter. Now, immediately following on from the salawat comes the discussion or the uh, notion regarding la'an. This has been uh, mentioned in the Qur'an for approximately 30 times, three zero. In 30 different places you find the discussion regarding la'an. Now, la'an is incorrectly sadly translated as cursed. Um, in actual fact, la'an is the asking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to withdraw his mercy from uh, an individual or a group of people. And it's been widely used in the Holy Quran. For example, in chapter 5, verse 78, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لُعِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا عَلَى لِسَانِ دَاوُودَ وَعِيسَ بْنِ مَرْيَمِ Those who disbelieve uh, were uh, sent a la'na by Dawood and Isa ibn Maryam. ذَلِكَ بِمَا عَصَوْ وَكَانُوا يَعْتَدُونَ They were disobedient and they were transgressors. Uh, in chapter 4, verse 93, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمْ Whomsoever kills a believer deliberately, their uh, consequence will be that they will uh, be in hellfire for eternity. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَنَهُمْ وَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَنَهُ Allah is angry against him or her, and the la'na of Allah falls upon them. So, the concept of la'na is very much Qur'anically established. It is not, according to some people, somehow uh, related to only the school of Ahl al-Bayt, but deeply rooted in the Holy Qur'an. In fact, when we look and study uh, the seerah of the beloved Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings be upon him and holy, holy progeny, we find numerous examples of the la'na. Uh, by the Prophet upon certain individuals. For example, a Shahristani in, in Al Milal wa Nahal, famous book, he comes forward and says that the Prophet of Islam sat on the mimbar in Medina and when he dispatched Usama bin Zayd bin Haritha to lead the army towards the end of his blessed life, the life of the Holy Prophet, against the Romans, some individuals chose not to join the army and therefore they disobeyed the Prophet. The Prophet was very much unhappy about this, quite angry, and said, May the la'na of Allah fall upon whomsoever does not or did not join the army of Usama. Likewise, in the book, famous book, Sawa'aq al uh, there is a, a famous narration that the Prophet of Islam says, Sayyidkhulu alaykum rajulun la'een, some, a man who is uh, the recipient of the la'na of Allah is about to enter. And this man by the name of Hakam ibn al-As uh, entered, uh, who is of course an enemy of the of Prophet of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then there is another narration which is found in Kanz al-Ammal, a non-Shia text, which says the Prophet of Islam prayed and said, Allahumma il'an al-qa'id wa-sa'iq wa-raqib. Three people he saw. He saw Abu Sufyan and uh, Abu Sufyan carrying his son Muawiyah and next to him, 
his brother, so Muawiyah's brother. They were walking. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the Prophet of Islam says, Oh Allah, send your la'na upon the one who is carrying, the person who is being carried, and the one who is walking with them. Okay, so this is a clearly a demonstration of the fact that this was utilized by the Prophet of Islam. And we have numerous instances of the imma, the Imams, alayhim salam, of course, uh, displaying this because it's Quranic. It is there in the Quran. La'an as a concept is found in the Quran. And therefore, it is following what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing. And it is not simply, uh, simply saying, I hate somebody. It's not like that. It is not sending our own dissociation. It's asking God to dissociate from them and to increase his uh, rejection and uh, withdrawal of the mercy from them. So, do they need it? Certain individuals, such as, for example, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, his father, for example, uh, other individuals who have caused much uh, destruction and much hurt to the Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt, are they in requirement? I mean, do we need to send la'na upon them? Well, similar to how salawat increases the status of an individual, the more la'na that's sent upon those the other, on the other side, individuals, enemies of Allah, the more punishment they get. The, more, the lower their position would be uh, and the more torment they will be receiving. Because the worst punishment any human being can attain is to be uh, deprived from the mercy of God. The mercy of God is the number one goal and wish for every human being. Because, you know, without the mercy of God in this world and importantly in Akhirah, human beings cannot attain anywhere and cannot go to Jannah, for example, without the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The whole concept of la'an in the Qur'an and the idea of the dissociation is deeply understood and rooted within the Shia Aqeedah, of course, within the Furu' al-Din, the Tawalli and the Tabarri notion, the idea of the correct following and the rejection. And it is simply demonstrated as seeking perfection and dissociating and rejecting, rejecting imperfection. And it is certainly part of the fitrah because uh, Quran tells us, you know, this notion of believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is part and parcel of our lives. La ilaha illallah. So la ilaha illallah summarizes wilaya and tabarri. La ilaha is tabarri. Illallah is wilaya. So you are rejecting any other deities, any other associations with God, and you're saying God, the Almighty, it is, is the absolute perfect being, He is the Lord, He is the creator, the majestic, uh, absolute uh, creator of everything. Therefore, what we understand is that the notion of la'an is simply part of human behavior in the sense that we like to dissociate ourselves from people whom we think are leading us astray or bad for us, and we associate ourselves with good people who are helping us in a positive manner. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identifies who are the good people and who are the bad people for us. And this rejection is of the utmost importance of those who cause us harm and are the source of deviation. And that's why somebody came to Amir al-Mu'mineen and said to him, Ana uhibbuka wa uhibbu fulan. I love you and I love someone else, an enemy of his. And the Imam Ali Salam said, you are blind. You can't be loving me and my enemy at the same time. It's not possible for the human being to uh, somehow be hypocritical in this particular uh, way. And therefore, uh, the Quran here informs us that those who hurt the Prophet, Allah, as well as the Prophet, are the recipients of the la'na of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this world and the hereafter. Of course, within this notion of the discussion of la'na, there comes the secondary considerations which our ulama have spoken about with regards to certain individuals and how it should not be done in public, etc., which is very well known. Now, this idea of yu'dhun Allah wa rasulah, they are hurting or somehow tormenting Allah and his messenger. What does it mean? Can God be hurt? Of course, there is a a discussion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is not to be compared to his creation and therefore he does not experience the emotional 
expressions or feelings that we human beings experience. Yes. So what does it mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those who hurt Allah and his messenger? Well, some Mufassireen said it is shirk and kufr when people uh, uh, reject God or when they associate other gods with him. That somehow hurts him, hurts Allah. Others have said, well, it is about hurting the Prophet and the believers, which ultimately hurts God and torments God. So that's why Allah says, Inna But others have commented to say it is difficult to have some kind of attribution of uh, emo human, at least how we understand emotional feelings towards God subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why he's exonerated from this idea. Um, so how do we explain it? Well, they say it's simple. It is the Quran saying anyone who attacks the Prophet and hurts the Prophet is in, a, in actual fact, it's like hurting Allah. Yes. So it's highlighting the status of the Prophet. It's highlighting the position of the Messenger of Allah. Peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. Interesting opinion I found. One of the ulama said, well, it is actually hurting oneself. So the notion is that when you hurt Allah by being uh, disobedient to him and going against his commands, you're not hurting God per se, you're hurting yourself. It is how rebounding towards you. You are the primary um, uh, recipient of the hurt, so to speak, although people do not necessarily uh, know about this. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us free will, he wanted us to be saved, and therefore, he uh, pr presented us with what is needed for us to attain uh, this prosperity. However, our decisions reflect back on ourselves. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, whomsoever hurts me, he's saying that I created you for paradise. And that's why if you go against what I've created you for, it's like you're hurting me. So it's understood in that way as well. What about hurting the Prophet? So, inna ladina yu'dhun. Yu'dhun comes from adhiya. Adhiya in Arabic means to hurt. It means to injure. It means to torment. The Prophet of Islam, everything that was uh, subjected to the, or the Prophet, so whether it's, for example, uh, words, whether, for example, actions, what happened after he passed away, all this is included uh, until maybe even today. Anything that hurts the Prophet is um, something which uh, brings down the uh, punishment of Allah and withdrawal of his mercy in dunya as well as akhirah, of course. Examples in the Quran of how the Prophet was hurt. In chapter 9, verse number 6, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that وَمِنْهُمْ الَّذِينَ or 61, verse 61 وَمِنْهُمْ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ النَّبِي وَيَقُولُونَ هُوَ أُذُن There was instances where the munafiqeen used to come to the Prophet wanting to ask a question. And the Prophet would just listen and listen and listen. So they would leave and say, he is just all ears. All he does is listen. And they were trying to spread rumors about him. So the Quran here in chapter 9 verse 61 says, there are those who hurt the Prophet by you know, ridiculing him or speaking ill of him. Yes. Um, in the narrations we find, of course, specifically what hurt the Prophet was the way his Ahl al-Bayt were treated or will be treated after him. So in Al-Bukhari, uh, uh, volume 5, we have the famous narration that Fatima bid'atun minni man aghdabaha faqad aghdabani. Whomsoever hurts Fatima has, or angers Fatima has angered me. In Sahih Muslim, volume 4, the word actually used is yu'dhini. So, for example, Fatima bid'atun minni yu'dhini ma adaha. Fatima is part of me. Whoever hurts her, hurts me. So uh, the Prophet of Islam basically summarizes and, and places that the Ahl al-Bayt, his family, where this will be the subject of the uh, attack against himself. So any attacking against the Holy Prophet, without a shadow of a doubt, would be hurting the Prophet himself. And indeed, uh, this is uh, quite clearly documented in history. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says not only do they receive the la'na on this world and akhirah, wa'adda lahum muhina. So as a result, 
they will uh, receive fairly embarrassing, humiliating punishment, chastisement from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the actions. Therefore, it is not a, a trivial matter, the idea of the Prophet of Islam, the idea of the Ahl al-Bayt and how they're treated. You can't just say, well, you know, it happened in the past, let's forget, let's move on. Maybe, you know, they did what they did and it's fine. No, it's an integral part in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights the sensitivity and the delicate nature of the issue. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِغَيْرِ مَكْتَسَبُ Those who torment faithful men and women undeservedly. Now, what follows after the previous verse about hurting Allah and the Messenger is the believing men and women because they are linked with Iman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying it's not only uh, the, the Almighty and the Messenger of God, it is anyone who comes forward and hurts and torments and injures the believing uh, men and women. Now, it is not any type of hurting. There is a condition placed there undeservedly for example uh, when it means when they haven't done anything to deserve it it's uh, when they haven't done anything wrong sometimes you're doing amr bil ma'roof nahi anil munkar joining the good and forbidding the evil and a believer may be hurt sometimes it's islam the criminal law they have to be punished the believer may be hurt so quran says it's very delicate very sensitive it says not all occasions where the believing men and women are hurt or tormented it's when they don't deserve it. Yes? Notice that that doesn't, is not mentioned for the previous verse for the Messenger of Allah. Because the Messenger of Allah is only hurt for the sake of Allah. Yes? So anything that is not, you know, personally, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's not like the believers. The believers are uh, sometimes having to be punished, sometimes having to be rebuked, and so on and so forth. Any form of hurt, against the believer, either verbal or physical, is included here. So, um, the Imam السلام, the sixth Imam, Imam al-Sadiq السلام, says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ يَقُولْ لِيَأْذَنَ بِحَرْبٍ مِنِّي مَنْ آذَى عَبْدِيَ الْمُؤْمِنِ In Al-Kafi volume 2, Imam al-Sadiq says, Allah says, whomsoever hurts a believing servant of mine will have to prepare for war with me. So, uh, it is today, sadly, a matter that we find quite widespread in uh, some mediums, such as social media. You find that some people find it very easy to attack other believing men and women, ridicule them, spread uh, ghiba or, as we will come, buhtan, slander, or anything like that. And th they are taking it very lightly or, for example, on private chat groups or anything like that. It's very, very important that we recognize the gravity of the situation here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who do so uh, have, first of all, committed what's known as buhtan. Buhtan in uh, Islamic ethics is when you say something about someone which they have not done or they do not possess. Ghiba is when you say something about someone which they actually have. So, God forbid, I, God forbid, or somebody comes and says about a believer or, or, or a, a, a sister, believe in men or women, in, 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 in the gathering or with a few people, that uh, they, they have a really bad smell. And they do. That's ghiba. But if uh, the same, an individual would come and say, and at the same time, they, they, they are so rude, they always use profanity and vile words. But they don't. That's buhtan. That's a lie, but it's, 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 it's worse than riba. Riba is devastating in terms of its repercussions. But buhtan is when you slander and you say things about somebody which they don't actually, it's, it's, it's not an existent at all. So it's fabricated, it's not something that they... So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that's buhtan, wa ithman mubina, and a very huge sin. It's a very big sin. It's not uh, something to be taken lightly. Um, some ulama have said that there is a cause of revelation for this, 
which is linked to the next verse as well. The cause of revelation is that uh, the munafiqeen in Medina were spreading rumors about the believers. So they would be uh, going to different places, talking about them, spreading false statements about them. In specific terms, what happened was they would wait after Salatul Maghrib and Isha at night and they would be attacking females who would come to the masjid to pray or speaking ill of them or spreading rumors about them. And uh, whatever the cause of revelation, uh, it, it does, it's, a, it's a message that, of course, remains until the Day of Judgment, the notion on the importance of uh, the, the being very careful when talking about others, other believing men and women uh, in front of others or in any medium that uh, we may be in. And, uh, of course, the Qur'an says, فَقَدْ احتملوا. In Arabic, there is حَمِلْ and احتمل. Two different things. Hamil is when you carry something and you're able to carry it. Ihtamal means when you're not able to carry something. It's just not possible for you to carry it. So, when the Quran says, فَقَدْ احتملوا بُهْتَانًا وَإِثْمًا مُبِينًا It means you will not be able to deal with the repercussions of this act. You can't carry it. You can't necessarily uh, deal with the punishment uh, which is uh, quite clear and doesn't need the shara or the uh, Islamic uh, law to uh, highlight and to say what the repercussions are. In verse 59, we are given one of the most important verses with regards to hijab and the Islamic dress code uh, that is uh, primarily for uh, the females, but some elements of it, uh, certainly, certainly with regards to the social aspect of it, are applicable to uh, males too. Ya ayyuhan nabi, qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'mineen. O Prophet, inform your wives, your daughters, and the wives of the believers, or the women of the believers. Now, first question, did the Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, have more than one daughter because the quran here is saying O oh, prophet say to your wives as well as your daughters so it's plural it's not your daughter it's daughters so this has been the subject of a discussion amongst historians and some of the theologians with regards to this issue some have said yes he has three other daughters in addition to sayyida fatima peace and blessings be upon her they say they are called Ruqayya, Zainab, and Umm Kulthum. So these three, in addition to Sayyida Fatima, some scholars from especially our brothers, the Ahlul Sunnah, have said these are the four daughters of the Prophet. And in Jannatul Baqiya, they are buried, they say the three are buried together. The three are daughters, Zainab, Umm Kulthum, and Ruqayya. Some of other scholars, certainly many Shia ulama, have come forward and said no that the three, uh, these three so-called daughters are adopted daughters of the Prophet. They are either daughters of uh, the uh, sister of Khadija by the name of Hala, who passed away and Khadija sallallahu alayhi looked after them. Or in a much weaker narration, some have said or opinion, it is Khadija's own daughters who, and they say she was married before the Prophet, and she had daughters, and when the Prophet married uh, Khadija, of course, they became his daughters too. Um, although that is with the opinion that she was maybe 40 when she married the Prophet, although uh, careful analysis and study of narrations presents to us the likelihood, and Allah knows best, that Khadija married the Prophet whilst at the age of 27 or 28, and the Prophet was 25. Peace and blessings be upon them. Uh, why is this idea, this notion, that they are not the daughters of the Prophet stronger than the suggestion that they are? First of all, uh, a couple of them were married to uh, Abu Lahab's um, sons. And the Prophet of Islam would not marry his own daughters, his own very own daughters, to his enemy. Yes. 
So the idea is that the Quran tells us that they cannot be married or any Muslim cannot be married to a mushrik, to a non-Muslim. So how is that possible? Number one. Number two, when we look at the world of narrations, we find that uh, there is really no comparison at all between how much Sayyidat Nisa Fatima has been mentioned and praised and stories relating to her are present with regards to the Prophet of Islam. But when we compare to the other three, it's very minimal. In fact, some have said there's practically no narrations out there or very, very few. If they were really the, why, the daughters of the Prophet, why did the Prophet not mention anything about them? Why do, why do we not have narrations about them as such? So it goes to show that they were not uh, the actual daughters of the Prophet. Now, why does the Quran then call them daughters? Well, you know, the Prophet of Islam would look after them. So in actual fact, they would be somehow included within the uh, definition, uh, even though that they are, uh, that he, uh, they were perhaps the daughters of the Khadija's sister, and uh, they, the Prophet of Islam took on the responsibility of caring for them. The cause of revelation for this verse is that, uh, as we mentioned in the last verse, that the women, uh, the slaves and the free women used to go to pray uh, in Masjid al-Nabawi. So you have some men, some youth, of course, who are hypocrites and others. They would attack them after they leave because some of them, they thought it's slave girls, so they can attack them and do whatever they want with the slave girls. And the, the, the way the slave girls, as well as the ones who are free, were dressed were the same, and they were not uh, distinguished as such. And therefore, this verse was revealed with regards to the importance of um, hijab and the dress code to cover the entire body. Uh, and, and to protect them from the attacks of these individuals and of course going forward uh, for people of all times too. So, the words there is يُدْنِينَ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ جَلَى بِبِهِنْ that they should draw closely over themselves their jilbab, so to speak. Now what is the uh, jilbab? In Lisan al-Arab, which is a book which uh, lexographers use, to identify the meanings of certain Arabic words. It is said that jilbab is from the word jalb, which means something which completely covers something. That's what it means. So an example they've given is the darkness of the night. How darkness covers the night entirely, or covers the skies. Yes, doesn't leave any light, so to speak. That is uh, an example given in that same book about what uh, jilbab is, yes. It can either be res uh, referred to as jilbab or jalbab, both are correct in the Arabic language. Now, it is identified and known as a uh, garment or a piece of clothing that essentially uh, covers uh, from the top of the body until the bottom, so from the head until the bottom. Uh, and it is placed in an appropriate manner. So it's not just thrown, yes? It is kind of uh, adorned in a particular way uh, to fulfill that very objective or that very uh, thing that it's named after. Um, and when we look at the word yudnina, this highlights this too. So the word yudnina in the uh, Arabic language is with regards to how it is placed. So yudnina is to be wearing and adorning this particular dress code in the appropriate manner, in the right way uh, to be putting it properly. So the Quran says, first of all, O Prophet, start at home. So there's no point in forming others and teaching others when we have not looked at our own setups, our own family members. So this change, this command, this instruction begins at home. So the Prophet of Islam says, okay, uh, it's told, start at home, Ya ayyuhal Nabi, قُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكَ Your wives, your daughters, and the women of the faithful, that they should place this very loose article of clothing that covers their entire body from top to bottom. And um, what is interesting, of course, is that the jilbab uh, is put next to the khimar. Khimar is 
also mentioned in the Quran in Surah An Nur in chapter 24, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it. And there the khimar is identified as that which covers the head as well as the neck. So it reaches up to the uh, kind of chest area or the bosom area here. And the jilbab, of course, is one that covers the entire uh, body uh, from top to uh, toe. The beauty of this verse is that it highlights very important philosophical as well as uh, identifies what the hijab is all about. Okay, at least in certain important dimensions. ذَلِكَ أَدْنَى أَنْ يُعْرَفْنَا فَلَا يُؤْذَيْنَ That the verses say these, these, this idea, this hijab is for identification and as well they are not to be molested or hurt or troubled or injured in any particular way. So when the Quran is legislating the hijab, it is also informing us about what the idea and the ethos behind hijab is. And this is very important, especially for our youngsters out there today, as well as you know, non-Muslims who don't necessarily understand what the hijab is all about, to try and explain what the Quran has told us. Number one, it's a matter of an identity for Muslim women. So they are identified as Muslims. And you can see that when, you know, we have some hijabi sisters, for example, on television or on the uh, media or anywhere else, uh, they are there in politics, for example, people immediately see, oh, they must be Muslim. Yes, so it is a, it's a form of unique identity for our sisters. Whereas for men, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, even the beard is not a sign that you are a Muslim. There's no necessarily something that you would wear normally for the majority of men to illustrate that you are Muslim, unless, of course, this uh, cap that some people wear, which has been associated in recent times, so to speak. Um, the other thing is, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here that it is a means of protection. Hijab is a way in which our sisters are protected from advances, from molestation, from hurt from others as well. So it, it gives them, not only does it give them the identity, but also protects them from uh, the uh, possible ways in which they can be attacked too. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, say, don't worry, for those who are not wearing hijab, for those who have decided to wear the hijab, it's okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive, uh, and He is merciful. But as long as we have made that decision, as long as we have, in fact, uh, you know, taken on that responsibility to ensure that we uphold Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands and we adorn this dress code of modesty and chastity. Now, a few points before we end with regards to this verse and generally the concept of hijab in the Holy Quran. And that, and that is, it is going through a number of interesting challenges in this day and age. It is in the media in some instances you find uh, references, whether it's the discussion regarding Borkini, or whether it's the, the uh, niqab, uh, the face veil, or whether it's uh, the right of certain women to wear it, or Muslim women to wear it in countries like France, and so on and so forth, and whether the, it's about uh, how it's being depicted in the media and in social media, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of uh, discussion about it today, which highlights the need for us to have as much as possible our own discussions with our own sisters too, in a very calm, non-judgmental manner as well. And at the same time, there are people who are questioning its obligation. They're talking about, oh, it's not wajib. It's not uh, necessary, it's man-made. Man-made as in he, uh, the, the male species are the ones who placed it and so on and so forth, trying to create discord and confusion in the minds of some of our sisters. And in this case, then, then there needs to be much more presentations using the Quran, using the Sunnah of the Prophet and his Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, to illustrate how hijab for 1400 years has been fairly established and the scholars, both Sunni and Shia, have discussed its obligation 
quite widely. It's not a matter uh, that they have disputed, for example, or the scholars within one madhab have disputed. Yes, there are here opinions here and there, but by and large, you're talking about the majority who have established the obligatory nature of the hijab. And at the same time that we discuss the physical hijab, we should also be addressing the social hijab and the role of our brothers, the men, uh, and the fathers, and the husbands in their regards to supporting their wives in adorning the hijab, as well as the limitations of the uh, free mixing, to, so to speak, or the uh, lack of attention to uh, what needs to be observed as far as modesty and uh, respect and uh, etiquettes when it comes to dealing with the opposite gender who is non-mahram. And today, another feature that we find as well is um, how some of our sisters have taken it, began to think about taking it off, or have already taken it off, or have done so and have gone to mediums such as YouTube or the media have spoken about this. And we have to deal with this in a, in a calm manner. We have to try to understand why um, some of these sisters taken their hijab off. What is the reason? Is it possible that it's, uh, you know, external factors, if it's possible that it's a matter that is um, not necessarily related to them not being convinced that the hijab is wajib, but perhaps, perhaps uh, it is to do with iman, uh, to do with peer pressure and so on and so forth. Having said that though, there are some voices that say, you know what, hijab is a purely female issue and the males should not be talking about it. Yes, they should not be talking about it ideally in a judgmental way or condescending manner, but it is a subject that people need to discuss together to try and find solutions, to try and find avenues to help people uh, who have, for example, decided to take it off, either in terms of why it's necessary, why it should be adorned, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least what we know, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it obligatory and so on and so forth. And of course, taking example and seeking guidance uh, in the role models that existed in history, specifically the Lady of Light, Sayyida Fatima, peace be upon her, her daughter Sayyida Zainab, some righteous uh, wives of the Prophet like Umm Salama, alayha, and the way they fought for hijab, the way they adorned the hijab, uh, should uh, continue to be a, an important factor of the discussion when it comes to the, the obligatory nature and the importance of this particular uh, act of ibadah act of devotion to God the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala for the benefit of the human being themselves. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq, to be able to observe the obligations and the, the uh, duties upon us. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow upon our hearts the light of the Qur'an and to accept our a'mal. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallillahum ala muhammad wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.